you to the uh, gala committee, all the nominees, and uh, the award winners. Looks like uh, all the sponsors have gotten an award, so that's good. That makes fun. <laughs> <laughs> that makes fun. Uh, uh, look, they asked me to be brief, and if there's one thing I learned from my father, it's, it's how to be brief when you're at a podium, right? Um, if it were up to him, he would say, Scott, I love you like a son. Here's your prize. <laughs> that would be it. Uh, I was lucky enough 12 years ago to get to stand up here and present uh, this award to my father. Uh, really, the mentor uh, to Scott. And now I get to do it 12 years later to the man who has truly been my mentor for the past 25 years. Um, you think I've been hanging around two fantastic guys for that long, someone would have rubbed off. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, as I said, I've known Scott forever. I think my earliest memories of him, I, I remember this clear as day. Uh, it was in our house, and, and I ran up to him, and he picked me up in his arms. And I, I mean, I was five at the time. He's not a big guy right now. He smashes me right into the ceiling, blood gushing everywhere. Now, we learned a little about clear height that day, okay? It's an important thing. Uh, but I, I've known him my whole life, worked with him for the past 25 years. For all of you that know him, the first thing that strikes you about Scott is he's so freaking smart. I mean, come on. Uh, I think a high school buddy of his said, look, uh, I'm applying to Cornell and uh, I think you ought to do so as well. Well, Scott didn't really even know what Cornell was, where Cornell was, or what it had to offer. Um, he was a little surprised that first winter when he found out where it was, right? But Scott, you know, got the application, filled it out, and of course he was admitted. Now for any of you that are going through the college application process right now, or have been through that college application process, can you imagine your kid going up to you and saying, oh, I'm just going to whip out the old Ivy League application, fill it out? No problema. <laughs> well, it was no problema for Scott. I mean, it truly was. Uh, he, he, it, that is uh, something that we all, we all see from him. Um, I, I got an email the other day. His, his, one of the things that makes him is his memory. He, he, I was reminded of this by Pike. He knows everything about our company. He's been working. Uh, there, 1972, and probably some summers before that. He remembers everything. He's constantly testing me. I think he's just doing it to take me off. Uh, we had we had a discussion the other day. He said, "Well, the, the, the leasing brochure is wrong. It says it's a 30 foot bay and a 30 foot bay and a 27 and a 28. They're 27 and a half foot bays. They're not." I said, "It's got a 27 and 28. That's up to the same thing." He's like, "It's not right." And the CAD department saying. Did this? It's right. Lisa DeBarton saying it's correct. Of course, we pull out the plans from 1982, and he remembered the layout. It's 27 and a half and 27 and a half. It, it's it's uh, unbelievably spectacular, and and that's and that's the first thing. I, I, that's the first thing I think we're all struck by. And anyway, back to the Cornell thing. He went to Cornell. He started in engineering. He's got that that beautiful mind. But he ended up with a psychology degree. And I think Scott would tell you that understanding humans, us out here, understanding how we uh, interact with each other, understanding situations, uh, that's really probably his most effective tool. He really gets that. And where that really showed itself to me was is back on an October night in 1997. We were up in New York. We were putting the finishing touches uh, on our and uh, deal with Rothschild Realty, now called Almanac, that if you are looking for money, don't look for Rothschild Realty, look for Almanac, you'll find that in the yellow pages, they're, they're there. But um, we were putting the finishing touches on a deal, we had been with our attorneys, their attorneys for a long time. I can't tell you what time of night it was, I can't tell you how long we had been there. I know it was a really good day for Saul Ewing. Um, um, and we got to the point where we were talking about governance. How were we going to govern this new company that we were creating? Um, Almanac was investing 40% of the value of our company into our company, providing us with the opportunity to 
to grow. Uh, really enjoy the success that we've had over the last 17 years. Um, uh, acquire properties, develop the land that we had. And, and it was a big issue. But the, but the solution seemed obvious to everybody. There were, there were three people from Merritt who had negotiated this deal. It was my father, it was Scott, it was myself. And there were three gentlemen from Almanac, uh, John McGurk, who was here with us tonight, Pike Alloy, who was here, and, and Jim Quigley. So it seemed pretty obvious, right? You need a board of directors, you need to figure out what you're gonna do when you have major decisions. Uh, so there'd be three of them, there'd be three of us, we would all choose a seventh board member, that way if you, if you had any decisions that really needed to go and, and get decided upon, uh, you'd have that, that time frame. Well, Scott really boiled it down a little bit. He, he just thought a little more than the rest of us. And he said, well, look, if this is truly going to be one company, one partnership pursuing a common goal, then why would we constantly want to be sort of lobbying that seventh board member who's really not part of this deal uh, to, to cast that deciding vote? Why would we want to just keep it what we call a balanced board? There's the three Merrick representatives, there's the three uh, Almanac representatives, and, and, and that's the way we ought to do this. I mean, we, this is one company. And we discussed it, and, and we discussed it a, a little more, and we decided that's the way it ought to be. I think that's, that's a truly a simply but elegant solution, and most people overlook that, right? They think, oh, the easy way is, is this way out, and everybody else does it this way. Well, that's not what Scott does. He can really uh, uh, boil down situations to their bare essence. Steve and I were talking about it today. Everybody seems to complicate things these days, right? Well, it might be easier to complicate things than it really is to just peel away all of those, those, those layers and, and get it down to, to the simple yet proper solution. Well, Scott does that all the time. I mean, he, he truly is a visionary when it comes to it. Our board, in 17 years, has unanimously approved or disapproved deals. I've personally brought some deals to the table that after a lengthy discussion, we have disapproved, but we have, we have done that every time. And Almanac, in their subsequent deals to ours 17 years ago, has used that balance board as a template in most of, if not all, I don't think all, but most of the deals that they've done. And thank you, Scott, for thinking of that. It really was an elegant solution. And that, that, that's, that's where he comes. Now, a few things about Scott that you may or may not know. We all know he's a, he's a spectacular golfer, right? Everybody knows Scott's a spectacular golfer. Um, I will tell you, stay away from him on the pencil whipping side, okay? I'm always on the winning side of a Nassau when I play with Scott, only to find out that I owe him $25. And I'm like, how, how do I owe you $25? Well, you lost to Bertie Sandys and Greaves, you know, like that, right? Because he's a good golfer. But I lost the Dingoes, the uh, Palmers, the Hogans, the Polies, yada, 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 whatever, you end up losing that. So stay away from him on, on that one. Uh, he, uh, Scott is a great guitar player. He has a fantastic guitar collection. Um, he, he loves jazz. He loves blues. I think anything prior to 1980 he likes. Maybe there's a few songs in there since then. Uh, he's an automobile aficionado. Uh, he's a wine collector. He's a sharpshooter. He's not as good as his wife, Caroline, but he's getting there. Okay, he will get there. Uh, reads everything. You know, in fact, Howard Perlow told me the other night that he and Scott had lengthy discussions about title issues. And Scott knows that stuff. Really, Scott? Really? I mean, title stuff? Come on. Uh, but uh, he, he loves musicals. He, he, he's, he, he either loves or hates politics. I'm not sure which, but he's very involved in politics. <laughs> he's, he's a mischief maker, and he's a practical joker. Um, as I said, he, he usually is the smartest guy in the room, but he's not the jerk to let you know it, but he almost always is the funniest guy in the room, I gotta tell you. Um, so, I think the, do, the Dos Equis guy, he calls Scott Dad. <laughs> now this award, the NAIOP Lifetime Achievement Award, is presented to the individual with an exemplary record of uh, commitment to our industry, 
and to our community. Uh, Scott's service to the NAIOP, NAIOP board in the past, uh, national forums, his uh, service on local charitable and business organizations, it really speaks for itself. Um, my dad started Merritt in the late 60s. Scott joined shortly thereafter as his right-hand man. Um, been with us for over 40 years. Perhaps dad set the tone. Um, Scott has continued that legacy. Uh, he led us through some very, very difficult times in the early 90s. Uh, he continues to lead us with integrity, with honor, with focus, and with hard work. I, I am truly, truly, truly proud to call him one of my best friends. Uh, and I'm proud to present the NAIOP Lifetime Achievement Award. Thank you.